Okay, so um, we will start the panel discussion. So this panel discussion will be moderated uh, by Susan Poole. Thank you very much to all the great panelists that we have today. Uh, we will start the uh, panel with very short presentations from the panelists. Uh, I insist on the very short. Uh, some of you have sent me a lot of slides, so we will be really in transition. Uh, on the time, the idea is just to give to the audience a taste of what your project is doing or what is your involvement in the different standardization bodies, and then move on to a real discussion between all the panelists. So please try to uh, keep short, and I will hand it over to uh, Suzanne for the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. So three to five minutes for the presentations. Less is always better. I, I will thank you for that. I will uh, signal that figure. Ah, thank you. Then I won't have to do that. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, okay. So I just would like each of the panelists to um, briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll start off with a presentation. So if you just want to introduce yourself and your entity, um, I'm Susan Poole. I'll be moderating. Luca um, Volganina from InfoCert. InfoCert is a trust service provider, identity provider based in Italy uh, with subsidiary in uh, Luxembourg and Spain. Um, we are a um, provider of uh, identity services under the Italian schema, the SPIC scheme which has been mentioned. Uh, we are running uh, uh, an EIDAS node for uh, cross-border identities and we are also part of the sovereign network as a funding steward. <clears throat> yeah, my name is Oliver Thiago. I'm with Uport, which is a consensus spoke. And Uport, we are building a decentralized identity platform, which is completely open. We've done a couple of pilot projects in the past, and I'm also working in WCC and Decentralized Identity Foundation on these standards. Uh, this is Carlos Pastor from Alastria. Alastria is the national, expansive national blockchain ecosystem, and we'll go. Uh, later on this planet. Patrick Curry, BBFA. Uh, Kai Wagner from the company Yolok in Berlin, a blockchain infrastructure provider for identity, um, SSI specifically, and I'm today here in my role as a blockchain, German Blockchain Association representative from the Identity Working Group, and I'm representing the position paper on SSI. Tony Bionos from Microsoft, uh, I'm working in the uh, identity division, uh, engineering part uh, on identity products. And I'm Ken Timzit from the EU Blockchain Observatory in Forum, and I'm also responsible for France at Consensus, the global blockchain startup studio. Thank you. So each panelist is going to give a three minute presentation. Um, just rest assured if it seems like we're going a little bit quickly on these presentations, we're going to have a lot of discussion time this afternoon and you'll be able to um, discuss further with the panelists. So first up we have Carlos from Alastria. I will try to be very short. Uh, well, first of all, the alignment with uh, EPR and SSI, that is uh, pretty obvious. So I will go ahead and you, you know, so we, 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 I will start with the, the general flow of information. The general flow is, as um, Andrea mentioned before, is from a tester to give information that is a test and so sign with a trend signature to the user who will be in charge of all information that is related to him or to her. Um, all this uh, information will be stored in a private uh, storage that could be managed uh, by the user and uh, under his sole control. And when uh, some of his information is required to be presented to us in order to get a, a service, uh, the user is, who is going to select the attributes to be presented to the user. Mm -hmm. These attributes don't need to be the identification, only in some cases need to be identified. Uh, for example, to get some service, you only have to show that you are over 18 or something like that. Or to rent a car, you don't know even to give your, your name, but give your uh, driving license and some other information. Uh, well, the main, the main information, uh, the, the user will get, uh, will use the old information through a mobile application that is going to provide services for IP generation the, and the first uh, time. Then uh, at the station gathering, so getting all the information that from different service providers, from different attesters. 
then uh, move to authentication. So the user has to be uh, authenticated by the service provider. But the service provider is also going to be authenticated by the user. And uh, finally, presenting claims that is, uh, if you want uh, some uh, extended version of authentication. Uh, what is very important is uh, that all these actions uh, should be uh, unlinkable for, for, for the third parties. So when I um, present a, a claim to a service provider, nobody will know uh, that I'm presenting this uh, claim to a given service, pro uh, given service provider. And even, uh, even the, the, the tester of the information that I presented to the service provider is not uh, linkable to, to, uh, for anybody. So uh, we have uh, mm, used the, the blockchain in a way that prevents uh, link, uh, linkability of information of the actions that uh, the user uh, has at the first time triggered. And, well, uh, I think that uh, I, can, I can stop here and uh, go into the other things in a moment. Thank you. Next presentation. Ah, oh, okay. Is this working? So as already introduced myself um, as a standards architect, um, and um, thank you for your presentation. Alastria seems to be a great project, and I think you are building also on standards like EADs, and yeah. this is what I'm talking about. Um, I'm I'm, all, I'm working on these W3C and DIF working groups, which try to specify and come up with common specifications to allow a different projects like Alastria and other. Um, identity ledgers to be interoperable with each other. And the base layer and the base foundation is um, what we call decentralized identifiers. It's uh, basically a new type of unique identifier, um, a self sovereign identifier for individuals, organizations, or any things, so for everyone. And these identifiers are registered um, in a blockchain or decentralized network or being not on chain at all. So it's really just um, an ID. And these IDs are ledger agnostic, which means, as I already uh, mentioned earlier, these are ledger interoperable. You can use it with, um, for instance, Hyperledger Indy, and then use it in the Ethereum space. And this all boils down that you have um, a DAD, which looks like what we have at the bottom of this slide. Um, it's really just a random string. And Based on the DID, you will be able to resolve um, the DID to a DID document, and this DID document contains um, a set of cryptographic uh, material, like a set of public keys. We also have some service endpoints, and you can use these um, public keys, of course, to do many things with the, with the user. You can authenticate the user, you can verify signatures which were generated by the user. You can have end-to-end um, -end communication, end-to-end -end encryption communication with the user, and many more. So this is, this is really the, the foundation of um, many of these decentralized identity platforms. Thank you. And Luca? You'll be up next. Oh, this way. Sorry. <laughs> This, which is the next one. Yes, this already mentioned, it was the introduction of the company, so, so yes, thanks. Uh, well, the, the, as I said, my company is both working in EI as an identity provider under the Italian schema, so a very regulated board, as a process is providing the IDAS, so regulated. And also, and in the self-sovereign, so-called self-sovereign world, <coughs> which is not regulated, we see there are um, pros and cons on both worlds, uh, and we are looking for for the way of bridging them. So specifically, the EIDAS world provides strongly validated identities, but normally with a close and regulated set of data. data. What we would like to have. Uh, is normally to have portable identify, but well, such sovereign identity offer lower assurance identities normally, but they offer support for a large set, set of providers. So uh, is there a bridge to that? Well, um, the, this uh, in the context of EU, we say that the, we see that there are 
two approaches to um, bridging identities. One is the one based on the gateway model, which is the one supported by self building blocks, so the one you already see. The other one is uh, the possibility of having a kind of, say, a secondary identity. So either you use your identity through gateways to different countries, or you introduce a secondary identity uh, beside your primary identity, which is a national one. There are many ways of uh, providing a secondary identity. Uh, I mentioned a few, a, a typical centralized BKI. We can have an online secondary identity, but we can have a self-sovereign identity. My intent would be to promote self-sovereign identity as the most valuable way of having a secondary identity. So the schema would be something like that. You have your uh, national identity, your country scheme, and you have a secondary identity somewhere. And you can use, depending on the context, your primary identity, which is strongly related, subject to uh, EIDAS, etc., and your secondary identity as well in different contexts. Um, this I will skip is just to, to try to show what the benefits of SSI to other approaches. And this is uh, something going on now. Uh, we are, uh, for instance, in Italy, we are implementing uh, the creation of derived identity. We are specifically using sovereign infrastructure in this case. So uh, at the time when we create a national identity for, uh, for a citizen, we also create in his wallet um, a set of, say, an identity credential, which is of ledger, as was mentioned before, related to a decentralized identifier which sits on the ledger. There are other approaches as well, like the one which has been uh, uh, experimented in Austria, which take an existing identity, an existing Austrian identity, and convert it to a conversion schema into, um, again, it was a sovereign identity in this case. And this was a schema just to show how it's possible to do in a more precise way. And that's it. I will leave the questions for, for later. Fantastic, thank you. And next up we have Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go. So BBFA formed after the demise of the UK National Identity Scheme. It is a not-for-profit, started on uh, federated identity and access management, high assurance, uh, has worked in citizen, consumer, particularly supply chain, cross-border, border controls, uh, and areas of that kind in different parts of the world, uh, and have been very involved in EU developments as well, including law enforcement. Um, so for us, it's a much more strategic approach. We're not a service solution provider per se, but you can see here the different drivers that we're facing. In the, le in the banking area alone, we have over 20 different kinds of legislation in Europe as well as other regulations outside. And this is changing very fast as a result of crypto assets, which we haven't mentioned at all today. Um, and we will see new legislation coming in through the EU. There are different drivers coming up at a business level and also a sectoral requirements, particularly on accountability and traceability in just about every sector. So food fraud, for example, is one of the biggest problems that we have globally. This is a heat map just to give you some idea of the regulations and their impacts across the banking sector as seen from the European monetary reform point of view. And you will notice anti-money laundering, payment service directive 2, and GDPR as uh, major drivers and concerns, and also the data impacts on the right-hand side. And I would completely endorse what uh, Mr. Zavida was saying earlier on. From a legislation point of view, there's a little bit more information there. But these regulations are in tension, and they affect how blockchains can and cannot be used, and also how the consensus mechanisms work. We haven't talked about consensus at all. Um, and underneath all of this, we're assuming that the internet's functioning properly. It is absolutely not. And there's a lot that's happened in the criminal space, particularly on fake domains, and what's happening in the dark markets. Uh, so we're losing the battle on this one and EIDAS will become a target from a criminal point of view, and that's a discussion maybe we can talk about another time. 
So in the UK, uh, we've had a report from our government that was written for the Prime Minister on what is DLT all about and blockchain. And this document is now in at least five languages. To my knowledge, I've discussed it with many governments around the world and talks about the enablers to put in place. The UK, however, has gone further and our parliament has now produced what's called the Lord Holmes Report. And currently today, we have 23 working groups from different sectors, from a legal point of view, looking at new legislation. Uh, we have at least 11 other organized, uh, sorry, governments involved with us, um, and uh, countries, I should say. Um, so this, there's a huge amount of activity taking place. Against this background, from a trend point of view, um, I have to say, EIDAS is not that pro uh, prominent in the discussions. Uh, and so I think there's a lot more that needs to be done there. And what we're seeing is the legal change taking place. Technology is changing even faster. And the advent of dual routes of trust and new surveillance legislation will also impact this space. I've mentioned criminals. Um, identity is really changing very fast as well. And the key thing is to recognize the binding between the person, the organization, we have a lot of fake organizations, and devices. And we have a lot of fake devices. And uh, so we need to bring that out as well. And what the focus is moving towards now is real-time authoritative data. This is happening in banking and it's happening in many other areas. And the key to all of this, we've kind of touched on it, is pseudonymity. Minimum data exposure, and for me, the other technology in this is zero knowledge proof. The new advanced zero knowledge proof technologies are a game changer in this space, and I happen to be in a company as well, which is also doing that, and I would be very happy to have a discussion around how ZKP fits with the IDAS and some of the DID models, etc. we've talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Next up will be Ronnie. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Can I have this uh, yeah. plane thing? So I would like to uh, share with you some more information about our uh, decentralized identity project, uh, which we are doing with community players, which are also here on the panel. So basically, for, um, what do we mean when we say decentralized identities? So we, we come from a world where basically your identity is being registered and uh, also where you are going to be authenticated. So we, we see actually a paradigm shift there, where basically users will actually create their own identities, decentralized identities, put it on the blockchain, so they can always go back and prove that they are the owner of that specific identity. Uh, but what we actually want to accomplish, instead of what we see today, the, the data is being, sh being picked up by all the big corporates and people give the data to the big corporates, we should change that and basically store the data in personal stores. It can be stored in an encrypted way, and so um, all aspects of your identity will be linked in this, in this personal stores. The, the key thing is we have to do this in a very seamlessly integrated way for the users, but also for the developers. It has to be very simple to plug these new concepts in. So for that, we, oh, I'm first going to uh, show a video, which explains a bit more. Makes my life easy. No, that shouldn't count. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do fast forward? Millions of people and millions of organizations to work, play, and achieve more. We live in a world where our digital and physical lives are closely intertwined. From the powerful devices at our disposal to the apps we use to access a rich set of experiences, we are able to interact with each other in ways that were previously unimaginable. Our identity is made up of everything we say, do, and experience in our lives. However, countless apps and services use our identity data in ways that expose us to seemingly endless breaches of our social, professional, and financial data, causing serious problems for many. Not only this, 
but more than a billion displaced people have no path to social and financial freedom. Our mission to empower everyone isn't complete. We need a better solution. A solution that helps put the dreams we all share within reach. Things like educating our children, improving our quality of life, or starting a business. We believe every person has a right to an identity they own and control. One that securely stores all elements of their digital identity and preserves privacy. This self-owned identity must seamlessly integrate into our daily lives, providing us complete control over what we share, who we share it with, and when necessary, take it back. We are joining hands with the diverse community to build an open, trustworthy, interoperable, and standards-based solution that empowers you to own and control your identity. We invite you to join us on this journey at microsoft.com slash own your identity. So I just wanted to, um, uh, to show you one more thing. If we can go back to the presentation. So yeah, uh, these are some of the key principles, but you can read about these actually on the site I just went through. But this is a, actually a, a linkage between IDAS and uh, decentralized identity. So basically, to start with, we want to plug it into existing infrastructure. And for that, we need to leverage as much as possible existing standards. You have beautiful stuff out there like OpenID Connect, which is which all the social networks are using, uh, which all the applications are using. We just need to plug it in. And this is an example of it. But how does this link to IDAS? We see the distributed identity, and you can have many of them. Uh, you should link your, what we call, verified claims to that identity. And IDAS is a perfect way to get verified claims from universities, from the government, uh, proving your citizenship. And people will store these in their personal store. And this is the way how we can actually step up from low level to actually high level assurance uh, transactions. I'm going to rest here. Thank you. And Kai? Yeah, thank you very much. It's just two slides, so um, not that much of a, of a time commitment, I guess. But there's been a lot of talk about self sovereign identity now, and I think we've heard a lot about different standards, different concepts, and there's always this question, or it has been a huge question for the last one and a half years at least. Um, how can you find a way to collect the consensus of how self sovereign identity works and what self sovereign identity is about? and really just explain what consensus exists without going all the way into the details of implementations and different technological approaches to actually solve and accomplish this. And the German Blockchain Association just went for this challenge um, at the beginning of the summer. So we got a group of authors together um, from five, I think six different organizations residing in Germany as well as one North American organization writing a large report um, ultimately on self-sovereign identity, really introducing the concept, introducing the ideas behind self-sovereign identity, introducing where it actually needs to be placed as a concept. Um, you can find that under bit.ly slash SSI paper if you want to read it. Um, there's a public discussion going on under a hashtag about it as well. It's been just published two weeks ago, so it's pretty fresh still. Um, and this is, the, this is the outline of the paper. So we try to keep it very high level, very approachable for policy and business perspectives and actors that don't have much of, an, of a background in identity and especially also a background in blockchain. And that's what you see in the first chapters. And then there's an appendix for everybody who's really into getting down to the stuff that might not even have consensus yet, but there's a clear discussion, there's a clear direction in the discussion. And these are the points we point out in the different appendices, um, as well as there's a call to action that is structured for different sectors. So there's a call to action for individuals, a call to action for public sector, for private sector, um, a call to action for classic trust services. So there's a lot of knowledge gathered in this report. And one thing I want to point out in the, in the end is that there's not just been these six authors from six organizations, but there's actually um, I think 22 peer reviewers from around the world, um, people that are representing W3C, people from the DIFF, and people from different identity companies that all went into this report, provided feedback along the way, and this really can stand there as a document showing the general approach to self-sovereign identity as of late 2018. Thank you. Thank you. So now we will begin our panel discussion. And I just wanted to note that the forum is engaged prior to today, and these questions I'm going to be asking of come out of those conversations. Uh, there will be six questions, and I will pose the questions to some of you specifically, as we won't 
um, to be able to have six people answer every question. However, if you have a burning desire to jump in and I haven't called on you, that, that's fine as well. Okay, so this panel will be on e-identity um, standardization, state-of-the-art standardization for e-identity. And the first question will be, well, let's go over what are the existing standards and what are the active organizations working on those standards? And Patrick, I'm going to start with you. All right, first one on Thank you. It's off. Okay, I've got a denial of service attack. Right. Thank you. Um, right, so I should have said uh, I'm on four ISA committees. I'm a guest advisor to ITUT. I've been involved in IETF as well, and I'm glad to hear about W3C and so on. Uh, so from an ISO point of view, uh, at the, the, we have TC307 specifically on blockchain, uh, which has a series of working groups and study groups uh, in, internally, uh, focused on use cases, focused on terminology uh, and architectures, and we've got conveners for some of these groups in the room today, so I invite them to chip in later in the discussion, uh, particularly around security, privacy, and um, identity and also smart contracts uh, and interoperability and a couple of other areas. It has a joint working group uh, which is linked with uh, JTC1 uh, SC27 which is where all of the information security and risk management happens and the two main areas there working group one around security and working group five on identity and privacy uh, which is the largest group in SC27, Identity and Privacy, and SC27 is the largest group in ISO. So that gives you some idea of the activities happening. I am an editor of identity standards within ISO. And uh, we then have SC17 on passports and uh, uh, machine-readable documents, but in the passport world and also in the driving license world, they are moving to mobile, particularly in the United States, uh, when we look at the Real ID Act uh, and what's changing also in a passport environment and the issue coming through here is about validating passport data. It's not about this thing, I'm holding up a British passport in particular, which is a massive fraud vector. So we need to get away from paper documents. Um, we also have a new group called PC317 which is on consumer IoT and privacy. And we're walking straight into this key problem, which is that there are three approaches to identity. One is anonymity, where there is no personal data in a system. That's the legal definition. Secondly is pseudonymity, where there is personal data in a system. But that doesn't mean everybody gets to see it. So pseudonymity, which is the core of GDPR, is fundamental to the way ahead. And that means data minimization. So a lot of the discussion we've had on MIDs the minimum identity data set, there's a lot of issues about the attack vector that's created on MEDS. Um, so from a cyber security point of view, there's some real collisions. There is, um, and so in the PC317 area, we're going to see far more exposure of this because the IoT side is stretching into food and health. You are starting to consume technology which is bound to your identity. So what we're seeing now is far more of the standards community trying to link to legal, and this is the key point I would like to make. The, the laws are changing so fast at the moment. We are seeing requirements for uh, early bind, late bind, and then no bind, the bind, so the, I'll explain what I mean. We have classic early bind model, which is government issues an identity to a citizen. That is then used in a chain of trust by relying parties to issue further credentials, which we use in society. We then have a late bind model, which is what SSI is. And the challenge there is that you start with a, a token or cryptographic primitive and you bind attributes to that for use. And the problem with that is low assurance. And in fact, SSI is an intermediary in the trust chain. So what we're seeing is a third approach now, primarily using ZKP but it be done in other ways, where you, the relying party and the uh, claimant, the user in this case, is directly validating against the authoritative source. And there is no token. So this means there is no intermediary. And this is where the high assurance environment's going, and this is what we're looking for, for in the World Economic Forum in particular, but there are other initiatives as well, particularly for border control. 
and I'm very happy to take any further questions on that. Thank you. Thank you. That's quite a few standards out there, and that's you know from one person who's across many of them. Uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, Ronnie. So back to what um, the initial question: um, What are the existing identity standards, and what are the active organizations working on those standards in addition to what's already been mentioned? Yeah. So uh, I would like to call out uh, uh, the whole Open ID Foundation work that. Uh, it's been super, super important, uh, starting with uh, OO2, uh, which is basically a framework that, that many, many... Uh, Sorry, what was the framework called? Open ID Foundation. Oh, right, but then and you then said... The, the first important standard out of that is uh, OO2. There were okay. some previous ones, but let's uh, stick to OO2 as the, as the first uh, important one. And on top of OO2, they have actually built an identity standard, which is then Open ID Connect. Can't hear you quite. Can you talk into the microphone a bit more? Talking? Uh, yeah. Okay. So on top of uh, OO2, they have built uh, uh, an identity standard, which is called OpenID Connect, uh, which is picked up quite quickly by all kinds of applications. And so uh, um, then underneath these standards, they use quite a lot of primitives to, to accomplish this security for identity. And a lot of work there has been done in the IETF. Things like... Um, uh, What's the IETF? IETF, so the Internet Engineering Task Force, and um, so basically the uh, the work that's being used there, which we also can leverage in decentralized identities, is many of these applications use what is called uh, JSON as a data format, JavaScript uh, object notation, and so it's a very popular format these days, and so there have been a whole bunch of security primitives being defined, like putting uh, electronic signatures on them, uh, encrypt encrypting them and they have all, all been plugged into this uh, uh, Open ID Foundation standards and so that I would like to call that out as a very important one also. And can you talk a bit about why that foundation was created? That's blockchain were, was the origin of that identity foundation, is that correct? No. no. Oh, it's not correct, no, okay. Uh, it actually all started uh, <laughs> to solve a very important problem. So. Uh, let's say you have uh, uh, an application that, uh, or, or a service that basically is a, is a photo printer. Right? You send your digital photos to the, to, the, to the application, it will print them out and send them back to you. Now your photos are maybe on, on your personal store, whatever you have. Now in the, in the old days people used to give their user-ready password to these services so they could actually access these this, this, this photos, print them and send them to you, which is really the best practice you can imagine. And this standard, so OWOP started to work uh, on solving this, this, this principle by, by giving them something which is called an access token. So basically you authenticate to your service and you get actually a ticket from that service which you can give to this uh, printing shop and they can now actually use for, let's say, one hour they have access to your uh, photos that they, and then we can print them and after that it's over. So um, this was actually the, the origin of this standard. Uh, this is definitely not an identity standard, and that's why OpenID Connect was built on top of that to actually have an identity layer. Thank you. Does anyone want to add anything? Uh, yes. yes, Oliver. <coughs> yeah, it's um, funny to hear that um, all these, so because I was um, actually a member of every of these working groups, and through TC307 and OpenID Foundation and so on, and I want to point out or to highlight that OpenID Connect is not a, a standard which is really um, adopted currently in the decentralized identity platform world. We have their standards like um, W3C, Verifiable Credentials, and we have W3C Decentralized Identifier, which I was talking about earlier. And these uh, Verifiable Credentials are like, we are currently working on a data model representation which allows easier exchange um, of these credentials between different entities in the decentralized ecosystem. For instance, um, so and you can, you can, you can um, put in whatever attestations you like in a very in a verifiable way. So what you do is, um, for instance, the, uh, a TSP could issue a credential to a user which states that the user is, um, has first name, last name, whatever and signs it and the credential will provide a way um, not to allow verifiers to verify it. It's, that's why it's called verifiable credentials. We have W3C 
and we have decentralized identity foundation and yeah we have a lot of working groups dealing with stuff like what you mentioned uh, identity hubs and decentralized data stores uh, we have um, DID off which is a way of using these DIDs to authenticate um, users to establish uh, secure end-to-end -end encrypted communication channels between different entities and um, yeah but um, well openly connect is still relevant because um, at the last um, I Internet Identity Workshop in San Francisco. We had a track on how to come up with a DID of profile based on OpenID Connect because I think that OpenID Connect is a very well known and super wide distributed standard. We should really also take care of it that um, we still be um, backwards compatible with it. So I think this is, this is also very crucial. Then. So the two standards that you mentioned are DID and verifiable credentials. Is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. Um, WSOC currently has a, a working group on verifiable credentials, and we will have a first candidate recommendation, I guess, um, by the end of Q1 next year. So that's the, that's the, that's the roadmap, but um, this might be might not hold, but we will see. And we have the decentralized identifier specification in version 1.0 already. And this is um, currently maintained by uh, W3C Credentials Community Group. Thank you. That leads into the next question of which identity standards are actually currently being used by the, um, the projects that you're working on. So, Luca, I'm going to go ahead and ask you. Thank you. Well, presently, uh, for the legacy identity part, we are kind of bound to the SAML protocol. Since, as you learned from the presentations before, uh, EIDAS bridge works through SAML. Uh, by the way, SAML is not, say, the industry lead, and it's mostly, developed in, mostly used in public administration settings, not very much into the, the open setting where OpenID Connect is, uh, is the clear winner. Um, so that's one of the technology. Well, on the say decentralized part, now um, what the one we are familiar with, which is, as I mentioned, Sovereign, is insisting on the W3C specification, the AD and um, W3C. We are very interested in bridging uh, DID and DID auth with OpenID Connect, since it would open the way to a much larger business. Thank you. And Carlos, would you like to discuss what standards you're currently using on your project? We are using DITs also. Uh, we are also contributing to that. Uh, we are also using OAuth, and we are using also um, uh, Mobile Connect, that is a standard for the EMS uh, that is related to identify on the, on the mobile. That is really where the, the identity in those days reside. So, we are very interested in making it interoperable of the interoperability between um, Mobile Connect and all this stuff in the blockchain. And we are also working with the, well, uh, the 307 uh, committee of the blockchain, and uh, we are trying to standardize our solution at uh, the Spanish level and the European level with Sensor and IFSO. Thank you. Kai, did you have anything to add? Nothing. No? Okay, <laughs> no problem. So with all the various identity solutions out there, the question comes up of how interoperable are identity solutions currently? Does anyone want to take that one? Patrick. <laughs> well, I think, okay, so interoperability, yes, TC307 has a group uh, looking at interoperability from a blockchain point of view. Uh, which goes to things like consensus mechanisms and so on, which actually have an identity component if you are looking at regulatory compliant type blockchains. Now, when we come to identity itself, we are now talking about um, particularly uh, problems at the data layer. So we're talking data interoperability, we're talking cryptographic interoperability, system interoperability, technological interoperability and policy interoperability, and in fact policy is the hardest part. So EIDAS has faced most of this, maybe not all of it, and, and EIDAS, we want to be able to reuse some of these credentials we're talking about outside the EU because that's what the business need is. Um, so I think 
but the, when we talk about interoperability, it's really important to understand that we need all of those different kinds of interoperability, particularly for assurance uh, purposes. And so I know there are others in the group that will look at you know, protocol, interoperability, and so on. Um, but I, I offer this back. If we want to get into the detail, uh, so I would argue PKI Federation, when you get to high assurance, so there are four levels of assurance internationally, which maps onto the IDAS. Um, but the higher the, the assurance level, the, the stronger those interoperability mechanisms have to be. And so my background is in PKI Federation, and we rely on that on a daily basis. Anybody who got on a plane today, you may not know it, but you relied on that to get here. So uh, I think there are some lessons for that, um, but they don't all apply in the consumer space today, but that's beginning to change. So I look to some of my colleagues to, who may want to comment on other aspects of interoperability. Ali? Well, I do this in my daily life, basically. Uh, so, uh, uh, just give you some uh, a hint on how we approach this. So, uh, so we actually built identity cloud services, and we make them de declarative, meaning that you feed them with what we call trust frameworks, uh, and the trust framework basically specifies the behavior of all the parties in uh, in, in in your in your consortium, if you want. And so now you can, for each of these parties, uh, again, declare what kind of protocols they have, uh, SAML, uh, what have you, and all the tiny, gritty details of um, the... Sorry, can you hold the microphone super close? Thank you. It's so heavy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, within these declarations, you can now basically specify all these different profiles you want to use for that specific protocol. And so we see this very much needed because, indeed, there is so much... Uh, uh, different ways of uh, interfacing this identity system today. The, the advantage of this approach is basically that you can get some kind of, uh, uh, you can have a very complex protocol like a SAML protocol on the back end and on the fore end actually uh, an OpenID connector or what compatible application can just interface it and still consume uh, SAML uh, assertions. So that's the approach we take. Uh, thank you. Luca? Sure. I just uh, add to this. Uh, it was very good that you introduced the trust framework concept, which is uh, paramount to this setting. Um, yeah, part of technical interoperability that we know can be dealt with, <laughs> and in fact, the standards are done in such a way that the ID identifier can be mapped via method to different blockchains, but that's a technical part. The real relevant part to me is the trust framework. And in my understanding, my vision, EIDAS is one of the possible trust framework supported by a uh, distributed infrastructure. It is possibly uh, one of the most relevant. Why? Well, this comes back to the question was raised before on many identities. There's a, um, one very important thing to do this. In our experience, but you can have many identities, that's clear, and they apply to different settings, the social, uh, a community, uh, whatever. But what is really real relevant for the business is an identity where you have a liability behind. And EIDAS is a trust framework which grants this kind of a liability. You may have different schemas as well, probably with different, uh, with lower liability, or you have to, to build up a liability schema behind, which is what banks can do on their own, for instance, or telco companies do on their own, and this is costly. If you can import liability schema which comes from the IDAS trust framework, that's definitely a big value you bring into. Okay, oh, Oliver, go ahead, sorry. I can add something to the, to the protocol and technico technological interoperability. So we can see that we have um, DIF in place. DIF is a decentralized identity foundation where many of the self-sovereign identity providers come together, work together on standards which allow them to be interoperable even across different ledgers. And we have the DID specification and um, many, or actually, this is a mature standard and all of us that are in the, in the group agreed on, 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 on the specification. Thank you. I'm going to go to Kai next. 
just really to add on what Oliver just said, I think it's important to, to distinguish the necessity to have interoperability between things like the IDAS and the newly emerging SSI frameworks and SSI solutions and SSI providers or solution um, companies amongst themselves. So there's like at least two different dimensions on which we could actually start to discuss interoperability and I just want to point out because of my position today being here to present the SSI paper. Um, that there's a lot of efforts going on, especially in decentralized identity foundation, but also across different, um, like multi-country networks, for example. So there's currently a freshly emerging cooperation between the Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany to understand how different SSI solutions tested and developed in these countries right now could be made interoperable um, long term. So we actually achieved that idea of having an SSI um, universal SSI layer for identity. Um, and then there's another challenge to actually get this whole thing to be connected to EIDAs and other trust frameworks. Um, but I just want to point out that there's these two things at least that we have to take into consideration. Patrick, did you want to add one more Sorry, thing? yeah, because I think we're, we're, we're talking about authentication. That's really what we're talking about. The SSI model does not take into account the identity proofing aspects that occur underneath. And where this really comes out is when you have something like this. So this is an Estonian e-residency card issued to foreign nationals who don't even need to come to Estonia, but it allows you to do business in Estonia. And the Estonian government has said to relying parties that this is going to be notified under EIDAS. Now, whether that happens or not, that's not for me to say. But my point is this. You could potentially have Saudi Arabian citizens uh, British citizens, whether we're in or out or whatever, um, and obviously American citizens and others who hold this credential who could be part of an EIDAS scheme that would be part of this environment. So I keep coming back to this policy piece. The, the attack vectors for law, uh, for, for bad people, and indeed the requirements for business, both work across borders and they both focus on the identity proofing layer. So how credentials are issued that then get used and consumed in SSI uh, really needs to be understood because otherwise relying parties will not trust some of the solutions we're talking about. Thank you. Oliver, did you want to add one more thing before the next question? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I also think that um, you're right that um, all these SSI solutions don't really solve the issue about trust of the issue at the stations. <laughs> But um, these um, standards that are currently under development, verifiable credentials, DIDs, they allow you to, to integrate um, trust frameworks and to build, um, to, to, to allow issuers to be trusted between um, yeah, in this ecosystem. So I think there, there are some um, things that we can do um, on top of these uh, specifications. And EIDAS might be a great opportunity to be leveraged. I just want to make a quick point to the panelists here, which is that you are all experts in your domain and you've been to multiple working groups. I don't think that it is the case of the audience here. And so try to speak in a way uh, that they will understand the acronyms and the concepts that you're introducing. You know, if you're saying SSI is different from authentication, I have no idea what that means. I'm assuming I'm not the only one. And maybe you'd like to explain that, by the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll certainly explain it because that's not what I said. <laughs> so my point was that SSI, self-sovereign identity, relies on attestations that come from, hopefully, authoritative sources. They're not all authoritative. Um, and, and so the user can use those SSI credentials uh, in, and attestations to um, authenticate or whatever to a relying party. Now, my point is that SSI is focusing on primarily on authentication. What it isn't doing is engaged on identity proofing, which is the core uh, activity to prove that someone is who they claim to be. And that gets to the, ch in this case, for the audience today, we're looking at governments because we're focused on EIDAS. So we're trusting the government to have a strong identity proofing process so that you do not end up with Andrea Savida becoming Andrea Smith in another, gov in another country uh, necessarily and then, uh, and then that individual, we now don't know, is that two separate people 
is that one person with the same identity with flawed data. So these are real world problems. And if I can go back to what Jeff Goodell, when he was saying in the corner um, earlier on, <laughs> we are confusing identity with persona. You can say, you can create what you like as a persona. On your social network, you can be Christine or Christopher or whatever you want to be. But from a government identity regulatory point of view, you have to declare your, uh, your known identity um, as a citizen. And that's what we're looking at as a trust anchor for most SSI environments. I can't speak for everyone. I'm very careful. Thank you. Tom? I'd like to just quickly add on that, that the, the idea of self-sovereign identity is really to, to go into all different areas, of really like a horizontal cross Cross application approach, and there's surely there's the the level of government interaction where everything that you just said applies completely. Where we need to be sure that attestations can actually be trusted, that we might at some point also have an AI integration that allows us to go to um, assurance levels of high, um, which is really the kind of aim we should go for. But what self sovereign identity tries to achieve is not to actually introduce this attestation layer because it, it recognizes that there's so many different sorts of attestation. There can be the attestation between two parties knowing each other since childhood as attesting each other's friendship, all the way to EIDAS compliant attestation from the government. And, and that's really what, uh, what SSI does, what self sovereign identity does, is providing an infrastructure based on interoperability and open standards that allows you to manage all of this as a user, so as an entity. Usually you're a citizen, you could also be a business that has its own identity. You're actually enabled and empowered to be the one in control, the one actually able to press buttons to initiate interactions. And that's something that SSI does. That's actually the, the kind of USP of self-sovereign identity is that you put the decision-making point into the hand of the actual entity that is represented by the identity. And that's what this infrastructure ultimately does. The trust always comes from a different source. That's really important to understand. It's really about putting the, the ability to act and to execute on my own behalf as an identity into my hands without being reliant on someone else to do that for me. And the source of trust is coming from wherever this source of trust has to come from for the specific interaction you're in. Just to make this distinction of what SSI actually tries to solve, because we're not trying to solve trust, we're trying to mobilize trust in the control of the user. One more response on this question from Ronnie, and we'll go to the next question. So there are many, you, there are many business transactions where, of course, these uh, attestations, these verified claims are extremely important, and they are needed. Uh, but what we actually see is the majority of the transactions that are happening in our infrastructure is really not that. There are, for instance, there is a whole bunch of social going on, just social authentication, and then maybe multi-factor is being added by means of mobile. And for, for a lot of these transactions, this is, this is enough. But uh, this, this actually brings us also in a big mess. Because um, uh, if you think about uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica, what's been going on there, it's all these links with this big data mining that's constantly going on. And I think district, uh, decentralized identities can play an extremely important role there. So instead of using all these uh, uh, social networks, we can actually use our own decentralized identity for these low-level transactions and then basically do a step-up process. That can be done by mobile, by uh, verified claims from a, from, a, from a government. There are many, it depends on your application, right? Not all applications needs the highest level and most don't no, use the, it. The issue is step-up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, can you explain what step-up is? So step-up is, i maybe give an example of a, of a very, so the, um, in Ireland, they basically did um, a government uh, benefit scheme. And so, the, actually the, the creators of that project basically uh, thought we have to embrace people. These are vulnerable people. We, don't, we can't immediately get very high authentication uh, needs in order to get them into the server. We lose them all. Yeah? So what they actually did, they started with uh, uh, just social. Uh, authentication, so you could use your Facebook account, your Google account, Twitter, whatever it is, uh, in order to get access to the basic information. Now, once you want to go a step further, and you're really talking about benefits, and you're going to get a check, this is not going to be sufficient. So they invite people to a certain office, where you basically have a new mechanism that's going to be attached to your social account, uh, but which will be stronger, 
uh, than just a social account. And that, that mechanism of uh, uh, making a, a low-level credential stronger, that's what we call Snapple. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we've got a couple more questions left, and I'm... Oh. Oh, okay, well, thanks, I think the, personally, the, the, the important area is in the middle. Uh, social, it could be, social uh, networks could be done uh, as they are done uh, right now. Uh, for the, the very high level, uh, we have very strong security measures that are difficult to use. But in the middle, for normal transactions with your bank, with a hotel, with a renting a car, uh, with your university, showing that you are, have a, t a title, uh, showing that you are an employee of your company, all this stuff could be done with uh, using um, single, uh, single sovereign identity in a way. And uh, all these uh, uh, single sign on on all these uh, webs could be done with a single uh, identity that we could. Uh, we, that we can use and showing just the part of our identity that we need to show in a given for a given uh, purpose. So having the control of this, uh, the, the, the consent of the of providing that information about us that could could be called persona, but in reality is just every single transaction you show the part of the, your identity that you need to show for that purpose and no more. Minimizing the identity, the information, and having a strong authentication. Uh, and uh, backing your information with uh, the real owner of the original information, that is your university, your bank, your company, that uh, can uh, attest that, that piece of your information directly without having the need of a uh, trusted third party that uh, is going to notarize that. You don't need that if the original source of information is also well known and has a reputation uh, liability and even legal liability. I think that is this is the focus that we should uh, focus on to, 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 to improve uh, the, the digital identity usage, real use for, for the real users. Thank you. So let's talk about blockchain for a second. Um, how is the blockchain actually used for e-identity standardization, considering that often personal information and certificates are stored off-chain? So, who wants to jump into that blockchain question? It's similar to when Ken asked the question this morning. I'm going to start, with, start here with Luca. I will start with what's my, my view on this. That uh, you're right, there are different means of uh, storing using the blockchain. Uh, my uh, impression that there's kind of uh, agreement on the fact that. Uh, the blockchain can be used for what is normally called DPKI, decentralized PKI, which is the core. It is essentially association, the PKI, sorry, private key infrastructure, the one which is public, the, public key infrastructure, sorry, <laughs> the, 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 the one we normally know when we go to a website and see that that's a, a HTTPS ensured by certificate, or the way, uh, well, the way the digital signature is constructed. <laughs> So it's using uh, X509 certificates as a basis. So um, first thing is this, and I think there's quite a consensus of this. So you store in the blockchain association between an identifier and a public key. And that's the base of it. Then there are many variations. One is, for instance, you can use, uh, uh, you can store some kind of data in the blockchain but that's mm, not really probably the best way to do it. But still, there are, there are initiatives we do that. If you look at the, the key.vip initiative, which is the Chinese one, I think they store data into the blockchain. There are other initiatives where they only store consent into the blockchain. That's probably the Canadian verify.me initiative or other initiative, similar initiatives. There are other which store, and that I think is quite a good idea, so revocation information. If you have some issue giving you a claim, well, there's some, there must be some way of granting life cycle of that claim. And that is, in, in traditional PKI, this is done via OCSP, or Certificate Revocation Lists, which is uh, managed by the CA. The blockchain is a good way for that as well. So, Thank you. Does anyone else want to add? Oliver? Yeah, so um, the blockchain doesn't necessarily also have to store the um, credentials itself. So it's um, 
what a DID is, it's um, rather anchored on the blockchain or on any target system and you don't need to store anything at all on chain. What do you mean by anchored on the blockchain? Um, so for instance, um, in Newport's case, in our case, um, we just generate uh, Ethereum um, address and use this as our DID and because it's an Ethereum address, uh, everybody knows how to resolve the public key based on a signed message and then uh, we'll be able to verify the, the message without going to the blockchain. But um, what in our case, for instance, we support also to have key rotation and the identity owner change or to assign and delegates, this could be done on chain. And yeah, so this is, this is um, what people also do with the blockchain. But um, they don't store any um, personal identifiable information at all because this is due to GDPR and it's a, not a good idea. Maybe I'll ask it. I'll ask it an additional way. What is is there a benefit of using versus how you're doing? It's quite technical for most people, or many people. Is there the benefit to using the blockchain for um, e identity standardization? Uh, Kai, I'm mean, not trying to go with the most basic introduction of how this would actually be used, and I'm, like, I would argue from the perspective of decentralized identifiers that have to be in some way anchored or retrievable in some space. Um, and that can be different, like that's the whole idea of decentralized identifiers. We want to be able to have an internet of blockchains approach, so there has to be the uh, opportunity to work with Sovereign, Ethereum, Bitcoin, whatever other kind of ledger, Illustria for example, they can work as registries, so as decentralized public key infrastructure. Um, and what you need for that is really to be able to, to see that somebody is bringing in an identity or an identifier to be specific from some source, you have to identify that directly from that source, and this is what just Oliver introduced earlier with the BID standard and how this is actually um, including that information. And what blockchain offers for the identity space is that it allows you to provide identity to the digital space without having to rely on one central source of trust or one central registry. So what we essentially have here on the table right now is four or five different registries that work together or interoperably because of the way of establishing the identifiers and because of the way of registering them and making them resolvable. And that's the whole magic of it. And that's why you need blockchains for them. And also another part that uh, makes blockchains very useful is that you have this component of understanding when something has been initiated, um, as well as the kind of operations that come with it that have been mentioned before. Thank you for that explanation. I can see if we can pause for just a second that everybody is very keen to speak on this. Fortunately, um, we're gonna I'm gonna have one more combined question, and then we will have working sessions after lunch. So if you have a burning desire to share, I'm gonna ask you to hold that on this question because I think we could go for quite a while. So I'm gonna combine um, two questions into the final question. So please pay attention, panelists. <laughs> okay. So um, the question is. Have you, so we're here talking about EIDAS this morning, so I want to tie that back into our discussion. Have you incorporated EIDAS into your solution today? Um, and I'd like each panelist to respond. Um, how would you envision an identity framework that would work well with both EIDAS and with blockchain? So I'm going to literally go down the line here, and Luca, please respond. Okay. As for uh, EI, that, well, I partially responded to this question with the presentation gave since, uh, in fact, uh, we uh, work with EIDAS every day. We are trust service provider under EIDAS and we are in ID, operating ID schema under EIDAS. So the, the attempt just to, to put it in a concise way is to use, not to work them together, but to use a blockchain based approach. Uh, to create a derived secondary identity. This is the approach we are pursuing now, since we see that there is a requirement for public administration to stay strict on the primary identity for several regulatory reasons, but there is a, a, a very strong request from the commercial world to benefit from this trusted data if you think yeah, um, you go to a public officer many times under your life and he recognizes, he identifies you, he does an identity proofing. 90% of these times, this identity proofing material is thrown away. So, if you can use this 
um, identification material once for all, well, that's a huge benefit, both for public administration, which can reuse that if it is a claim in your hands, in your wallet, uh, also for business. And business are keen to using this information. They would be probably a bit hostile to using the, the say, EI does not infrastructure, this, since it is heavy, user experience is hard uh, and so on, but they would be very keen on using a secondary identity based on the same trust level. Thank you. Oliver? Uh, so we in Newport, we have not integrated with EIDAS in particular, but we had a couple of projects in the governmental area. So my vision of using EIDAS and blockchain or SSI is exactly the, uh, very similar to derive some more trustworthy credentials from EIDAS identification means or to leverage MTSBs or e-signatures or even qualified signatures to provide um, I don't want to say it, but um, qualified attestations or something like that. <laughs> and yeah, so we'll see and I think that um, um, SSI is a very good lever for EIDAS to allow private sector companies to be part of it. Carlos? Yeah, well, we're including the level of assurance in our EADs, in our attributes, uh, as a way, a standard way of uh, uh, giving the, the level of assurance, the certainty about this information. So the core, the core information, the, my name, my identifier, my initial identifier could be signed at the highest level, level but other attributes can be asserted, attested by uh, other entities that are not required to be the, the government. And uh, besides that, every every time that an uh, attestation is done, is um, is uh, recorded in the blockchain, you know, to to give more um, more uh, transparency. And at the same time, uh, the revocation is done also in the, on the blockchain in order to ensure that uh, uh, that everybody can get all this, uh, uh, this information. And uh, when you uh, consent on the usage of your information. That is also recorded in the blockchain, not the information, but the, the consent about the usage of the information and the removal, the withdrawal of that uh, consent too, uh, in a way that uh, it cannot be linked with, uh, with uh, who is the, the receiver of this information. That's very important. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I think the first point to make is that um, we're looking to separate off-chain personal data to identifiers that are used on-chain. And we're seeing a shift to one-time pseudonyms on-chain, which provides an extra level of abstraction and privacy. And in my case, we're using zero-knowledge proof techniques uh, to completely decouple. So it doesn't rely on a hash. It works on graph theory. Um, that, was a bit, that was a bit deep, uh, zero yeah. knowledge proof. Okay, so ZKP is the ability for two parties to prove that they hold the same information but without exchanging any data. Okay, got it. So that's really fundamentally important because what we have in existing encryption-based models is we have a lot of data exposure. And so ZKP in the standards world, we're seeing a move up into this in what we call linkability and unlinkability and there is I can name okay. the standards on that. No, no, no. If you want to talk about that? <laughs> but this, it's, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get to this point about the fact that we've got a technology evolution that's moving really fast here. And we haven't mentioned things like dual roots of trust today at all. So I, how this technology works in the user's hand in a mobile phone in the transaction. So anyway, come back to your question. Um, so today, uh, the decoupling what happens on the blockchain, keeping the blockchain as dumb as possible. So you're using identifiers, but the references to those are in, in interpretation and the use of the data is off-chain. Now you do need to put some information onto a blockchain, whether it's for audit purpose or whether it's for like OCSP replacement. Um, you want to be able to notify people at huge scale. And so those are really important. And what I would like to see is a discussion to evolve as to how, we haven't talked about how today, how can we get some standards in place as to how we leverage the IDAS in this environment that we can have an assurance scheme wrapped around this so relying parties know what's a good SSI model? What service level do you run at? How can I rely on you? So these are the areas that we're starting, we need to start to move into. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Kai? So just to summarize Oliver's and Patrick's statements, 
um, and 99% of that is what I would agree on. And I just want to point out here that we really need to take focus on this idea of a user-centric identity, even though that's a term that has been bashed a lot in the past. Um, but thinking about current EIDs and EID schemes, we've heard that they're used three times a year, and that's not a huge guarantee for usability. So what we actually have to achieve is that these novel ways of doing identity could be SSI, could be OpenID Connect. I actually don't really want to put a stance on what is encompassed in a solution, but we should allow for solutions that actually can truly allow the, the user or the entity that is involved to handle all of that from one one interface, like putting it like this. Because I think the only way to make it long-term successful for any of these approaches is to make them available through one single source of access to it and control of it. And I think that's what, what SSI tries to achieve um, as a concept. So just putting it like this. Thank you. And to wrap it up, Brian? Yeah, so uh, actually, uh, we can take a little longer because some of the oh, things get case. underway. Oh, in that case. And because it's going so well. So, <laughs> so we can take 15 more minutes for questions. Ah, oh, oh, fantastic. OK, Ronnie, take a breath. Okay. So, um, it's not for you, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, the, uh, the the concept of how we use it has already been uh, mentioned. Uh, you register the uh, de decentralized identifier on the blockchain, not more, maybe for, for the discussion. We actually see it's it's almost impossible to put uh, personal identifying information on the blockchain because that's basically in, in conflict with uh, uh, the right to be forgotten. So uh, uh, you can't do it on a, on a blockchain. So that's, uh, that's why it has to be minimalistic. Uh, on IDAS, uh, we are extremely keen to, uh, to explore IDAS for the, for the usage of verified claims, high-level claims from these different uh, governments about uh, citizens, about uh, diplomas, about uh, whatever it is, which can be used in business transactions. That's the real value of IDAS. We have done some experiments in the past because before the regulation with Stork, uh, but we are very keen, so if people uh, are doing interesting projects, uh, let's talk. And we are very keen to step into that. Okay, so why don't we do some questions? Do we have any questions for the panelists? I know that was a lot of uh, heavy lifting of a few acronyms, and SSI, once again, is self-sovereign identity. Uh, just to So maybe that. I'll start with a question, uh, which only you know, commands a simple answer. So my perception from today's discussion is there are various working groups and efforts to establish standards, some working together, some not. Uh, but none of those standards are really adopted. You know, when it comes to blockchain and to a large extent e-identity, they are not adopted in our day-to-day -day lives. So the question is simply, when, at what horizon do you see those standards becoming a reality in our day-to-day -day life? Three years, five years, ten years? Not true. Sorry. <laughs> so there are standards which are adopted in our daily lives. We just don't know it, or they don't know it, depending how inclusive you. For are. example, so ISO two nine one one five, which is the entity um, uh, entity authentication assurance framework EAAF, which includes the identity proofing stage, the credentialing stage, uh, and also the authentication stages. And uh, that document arose out of 9-11. So that has flown in, flowed into many areas of business, particularly pharmaceuticals, aerospace, and defense. And it supports a lot of what's happening on how our airlines and aviation work today. And so, for example, CETA and ARINC, which are both companies that support IT infrastructures in airports, they both are part of that framework. So um, we're seeing it also in areas of health, depending which country you want to talk about. If you're in Estonia, it won't surprise you to hear that there's quite a lot. So their privacy management for all their citizens is done on that basis. Their ID card is done on that basis. And many other ID card systems in Europe are also done on that basis. Um, so I think there's a, there's a very strong linkage. And indeed, EIDAS has done mappings to different identity credentials So uh, for 29115. Uh, so, and if you're in an ITUT speak, it's x.1254, um, so you can see I'm a real geek. Uh, so to answer your questions, there are lots of standards, and W3C will say the same, and ITF will stay the same. Um, so 
uh, there's a question. How do we educate people? Uh, so uh, the question was more uh, related to blockchain, uh, which is the... Uh, uh, okay, I'm not sure that was clear. Um, so forgive me. Um, just while I've still got the mic. So today, there's very little in the way of standards for blockchains. Uh, I've just been involved in the ISO security evaluation of consensus mechanisms. And it's the rap rapid change in consensus mechanisms which is making it a challenge to get to true international standards. Some people will disagree. What I would offer into this, which is going to make a difference, is new legislation, and I particularly raise the fourth Act of Parliament that's going to happen from Malta, which will give legal personality to distributed autonomous organizations. This is going to have significant impact going forward. And I would expect to see that in standards very quickly. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, just, so st standard, standardization of identities in the blockchain ecosystem, other answers in terms of when we can expect that to be real? So we haven't said this yet, but we keep dancing around it. There is two different dimensions to this. One is how do I use blockchain to support an identity service? The totally separate one is turn that round and say what do I need in the way of identity and identity standards to use a blockchain-based service. And we need to not to confuse those. Oh, I thought you were jumping in. Okay. Oliver. Um, yeah, already um, mentioned earlier that we have DIDs and um, verifiable credentials both in uh, W3C. And they, we can see that there's already adoption and we already have tractions and I think we are one, two, three, four, five people here, at least five um, who are adopting DIDs and uh, most of us uh, also verifiable credentials. So I think we already have some traction and we will see, as I uh, also mentioned earlier, the W3C standard on verifiable credentials will be have a first CR by um, next year, Q1. And uh, the ID specification is already in version 1.0, I guess, and we will see soon see a dedicated working group on decentralized identifiers. But I, I don't expect that there will be many changes. And so it, there is already traction. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to go to the question. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm just going to introduce myself uh, and a number of colleagues. Um, and acknowledge the, the people on the, the panel and actually among the audience that have contributed to this whole area. Uh, I'm the uh, editor, project manager of uh, TC307, which is the blockchain standards uh, identity project. And the I think the uh, just a, a comment that the, uh, the um, discussion so far, I think for those people who aren't uh, experts in, in these particular areas. I think it's quite clear that there are standards, many, many standards. That question, just to the last question, there are so many standards. In fact, there's a standard for everybody. Um, and what we're trying endeavouring to do in ISO, actually, is to try and combine those standards and provide a framework, if you like. We've been living with identity standards. Uh, perhaps the problem is the word identity, because it means many, many things to many people in many different situations. And uh, as a couple of people on the panel will will attest, we've had discussions through the last two years on identity and, and have realized really that what we need is a framework and a framework that existing standards can work into. And there's many ISO standards, as Patrick was saying, uh, you know, the, the size and shape of your passport and what the chip is, is standardized, but you know, it, it goes to huge depth um, because identity has been something that's uh, been standardized for many, many years. So the problem that I think we've got an opportunity to address within the uh, blockchain standards in particular is actually to be a unifying force, to bring the, the standards uh, together and actually provide a framework where it's not one standard winning over the other or finding traction here or, or there. It is actually to, to start bringing these things together so we have an interoperable world. And I think that's what we're, we're trying to achieve. So um, uh, I'm also the liaison for two W3C, for instance, for uh, TC307. And uh, you know that's the, that's the real job of, of the of the initiative. And uh, early next year, we're going to be trying to pr uh, pull together uh, many many of the uh, uh, I know uh, stakeholders in this in a conference um, to to try and um, you know establish a framework. We've already have a framework, and really to establish it as something that everybody can work with. 
So, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's a comment really rather than a, a question. Oh, but, thank, uh, thank you for sharing that. To comment from me. Highly relevant. Any other questions or any questions, I should say? Uh, we've got one in the back. Hi there, so I'm uh, Stephen Holmes. I'm actually also on TC307. I'm the uh, project leader and uh, editor for the privacy technical report that's currently underway. And I think what I'm really interested to kind of, uh, I guess, comment on, I guess, from what I've heard on the panel today is we talk about identity and linkage. I think equally important is the non-linkage of identity. And that is going to be very much dependent upon the actual use case. In some situations, you may want to enable the consent to give identity in other situations you may not so i think uh you know the new technologies that patrick was mentioning about zero knowledge proofs are one way but i think when we're thinking about identity we also have to think about non-identity and release of identity information so i think that's equally as uh, important a, a topic thank you um we have time for a couple more questions comments Sir, oh, giving you the workout little bit. Uh, hello, I'm Alice, the PwC Italy. So some of you mentioned that there are uh, already some projects where SSI-based identity are made uh, like legally binding under ADAS using a sort of uh, qualified, qualified verifiable claims. So. Uh, can you can you like share some of these projects where SSI based identity are uh, compliant with the are made compliant with ADAS regulation? Does anyone have a response to that? Something. Yes, <clears throat> but I'll have to stress it. Um, <clears throat> We need to pay attention when we're speaking of legal uh, EIDAS compliance. Since um, EIDAS specifies a set of things, it specifies part two what national identities are and how they should interoperate, and it specifies part three what trust services are and what they are legitimate for and what they are and their legal value. So, if you use a, a digital signal which has been performed according to the IDAS part 3 as uh, we're using a qualified digital signal that are certainly binding whatever wherever it's it is it is in the blockchain or in what put and any other place but but the point um, the, the, um, speaking to the, the proof of concepts we are ourselves doing which are related to um, bringing claims from banks to other banks to enable KYC operations, for instance, they are presently just proof of concepts. Since, of course, if you can have a claim which is signed with a qualified signature, the job is done. Uh, this is not with, uh, what we already reached since we are now using claims signed with keys associated with DIDs, which are not qualified. And the problem of qualification of DID is an interesting problem since uh, well, this will raise a, a very interesting discussion, but I think it's good to keep it for, for the update tables. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I'm Ian Jimenez. I am working in an identity provider in London, and we are doing a self over identity project too. And the thing is, I believe that the technology is here, the verifiable claims here, zero knowledge proof, DIDs, consensus, all of this is done. We have a proof of concept working. The problem is with the regulation that is not clear. Uh, and we need to have more involved the government. We need to trust the system. We need the uh, governments issuing or uh, issuing credentials. And then when the government starts to issue the credentials, it's going to be the root of trash and then how the system is going to work. I think the technology is here, it's only speak the people, educate the people, and to have a better user interface, but when it's, this is done, I think that the sensor identity is here and it's going to stay. I don't know what you think about that. Any comment from the panel on that? Carlos? Are you agree? Agree. Agree. <laughs> Ronnie? 
So just uh, uh, yesterday I was at another conference, and uh, so maybe some of you know Kim Cameron, who gave a keynote speech there. He's our architect of identity, and he actually announced that uh, in a few months we would publish an open source solution on, 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 on this, so where people can start playing with. So it's, that's completely correct. The technologies are here. It's just a question of integrating. Yeah, oh, I, I do agree with you, and, and I think that the technology are, uh, is here. Um, the, well, we have to develop a real uh, <coughs> of concept, and uh, we are doing that on, on Aste too. Uh, we, we have uh, the model co uh, completely defined, and we are uh, right now implementing that model in order to be compliant with the regulation. But uh, the regulation probably in some um, parts has to. Uh, to change or, or just be increased uh, to cover other technologies like uh, uh, um, like a distributed PKI, PKI and um, also other ways of uh, of uh, signatures that are not um, linked to a certificate. So we're maybe last answer from from Kai, and then we are going to take a last question from the audience uh, before moving on to lunch time. Yes, yeah, so on the, on the most, ma most basic level, like speaking about uh, DPKI, so decentralized public key infrastructure, what we have is that we have publicly available um, keys that are under GDPR considered personal data. Um, and this is a challenge that has not been actually, like it has not been clarified. There's, I guess, at least five approaches to handle this on this table. Uh, there's five approaches to obstruct, um, anonymize, pseudonymize, whatever. Um, but there has not been any real clarification on how DPKI in this interoperable Internet of Blockchains approach to self-sovereign identity, how it can truly be GDPR compliant. And this applies to network persons. So what we see a lot is that there's production systems for your, like legal persons because there it doesn't matter. Like if two businesses have a DID-based exchange, you can run that in production today and you don't have any liability challenge coming towards you from the kind of... GDPR perspective, but as soon as you do that with, and we have also a bunch of government, like public sector use cases, um, there's, it's, it's just not possible to run them or bring them towards production right now. Even if the technology is there, we don't have the clarity on this specific part, which is really the foundation of everything we've talked about now in the context of self sovereign identity, and then there's a lot of stuff coming on top of that if, if blockchains are used for different matters as well. Um, but it all, like what I think we can all agree on is that the DPKI part has to be clarified. So we are going to take one last question from the audience um, and wrapping this up. Anyone wants to speak up? Yeah, sure. Uh, just as one comment, uh, I, I appreciate that uh, you said that the technology is, is already here for, for these things. Um, I would uh, ask you then to please share any kind of implemented solutions that would show that these things are really working. At least from our experience, I'm going at the, I'm a professor at the Athens University of Economic and Business and also at the Greek Research and Education Network. We are working, for example, with Hyperledger Inti. This is very far from being ready to put into production. Uh, it's very difficult for them to set up. But then the underlying protocols that underline SSI have not been peer reviewed. They are just a white paper. They are not privacy preserving. Where that's what we have found. So they don't work as they are supposed to be working. So I am really looking forward to any real solutions that can, could be put to production. From those of you that said that the technology is here, I would really like to see things that really show this, that this is the case. Um, so who can answer that with a real use case? Or is it? Okay, so I, I think that was a really inter interesting point, and um, you're trying to say, so you're all saying that something's here and the technology's available, so please give us an example, or please give us a real-world scenario. So does anyone have a, a real-world scenario, or? Scenario, everybody has scenario. I like to see something. Okay, so you want more than a scenario. You'd like to know if anyone's actually using it. I think some of the feedback was that due to regulations or lack of regulations, in some cases the technology isn't being used. Um, Oliver? Brave. 
So well, um, so I agree that uh, we don't see many production systems at the moment, but we have a lot of um, pilot projects, and still, yeah, the, the technology has to mature, and we are working on it. Um, yeah, and we, in, in terms of quality assurance and assessment, certification, etc., I think that we, we in consensus, we already have established circles which especially deals with improving that and um, we also have something in mind, our mind that um, allows us to certify smart contracts uh, and so on. So there's, there's, there's work ongoing but we are not there where we will be soon hopefully. There's a very useful list of pilot implementations in the end of the SSI paper that I talked about earlier. We also have pilot, but it's impossible to Thank you. <laughs> uh, sorry, so it's not just SSI. Uh, I think this has turned into a, a uh, forgive me, uh, it's, it's very heavily focused around SSI. There are other capabilities and solutions out there which are using blockchain or seeking to use blockchain. Uh, that do not rely on an SSI model. And uh, I mean, I'm involved in one today as a pilot, which is working in Ireland, and it's comparing customer data, particularly address data, between Ireland's largest bank and Ireland's energy company. And all it's trying to do is prove that the data that's held by that cu about that customer, the address of data is either the same or it's not. There's a legal requirement for the customer to maintain their address data in both banks and in energy companies. So from a privacy point of view, this is done with no exchange of data. And the outcome of that is that the bank gets to know which of its customers' actual addresses are, need to be updated by the customer. So they go back to the customer and alert the customer to say, look, we think you, uh, can you just really confirm that you do live at 23 Acacia Avenue? So, these are practical examples. It may not be an EIDAS example, but it's, a, it's identity related. Um, and we can talk a bit more maybe this afternoon about where this is used for explicit trust for authentication and so on. So I'm going to go to Luca. Thank you, Patrick, um, for a response to that. Yeah, a very, very short response. When we say technology is ready, my understanding means that it's a clear path to technology out there. By the way, there's also some mature technology. Uh, you can bind a DID to the Bitcoin blockchain through the uh, specific method, which is mature technology. You can do that. By the way, the, the point is that 